pronounce people. Um, so, uh, so everybody, thanks very much for joining us on the community track. We've had some great talks so far, and I'm sure we have even more talks, great talks to come. Um, Shane uh, is going to talk to us about money and who pays for FOSS foundations. So the big money behind the behind FOSS. So if you want to be rich, join FOSS, no, or maybe not. We'll find out the answer in the next presentation. Right, there you go. What an intro. <laughs> yes, that was amazing. Thank you. Let's give it up for Sharon. Uh, great community uh, leader here at Apache. And um, yes, oh, we have the big bucks, as you can see. Sorry for the uh, US centric thing here, but we have the, the big dollar, um, mm -hmm. which is more than I've ever been paid for my work at open source. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's not that kind of uh, funding. Um, but we are here to talk about who pays for FOSS foundations. Who, what, where's the the funding? Oh, you've just gone on to mute there, sure, uh, Shane. That is my uh, yes. My my trackpad has decided today is the day to go freaky. Um, so the we are talking about the big dollars here at Open Source. That that one dollar bill up there. Um, so who pays for open source foundations? But we need to step back. What does that actually mean? So if you talk with a bunch of different people about what FOSS funding uh, means, they'll all have different answers. And I'm not necessarily going to have all the answers. I'm certainly not going to have all the answers for all the open source software out there for you. But I do want to give everyone a framework of how we can think about how open source gets funded, right? There, there are certainly some places that need cash, that need money, that need more support than just we all can give as individuals. Um, and this is a way to think about how to what things are actually money, what things are actually services, how that actually affects what we do today to day. Um, so there, I expect there will be a lot of other questions about this, and I'm sure I will, of course, be around, and I'll be posting slides on Twitter, and the video will go up on YouTube. Um, but first, let's talk about what, what is open source. Well, that's pretty obvious. Uh, how do you pay for it? Um, let's structure what that really means. A lot of it isn't paying. A lot of it is the effort and the contributions. Um, what kinds of things get paid or are volunteers, or maybe they're not volunteers. Maybe you don't know they're being paid. And then how do foundations, who are the biggest way to organize all of this, especially when it comes to money, um, how does that work? Yep, here we go. Let's go to the right browser. That's better. What does open source mean? Hopefully we, we all know it's source code that's available under an open source license. Everything in Apache is, of course, uh, open source. Everything at uh, plenty of other places are. That's great. What's really interesting is who's behind the project? Who is making the decisions? Who's doing the work? And a lot of the points I'm going to make are that we don't always know uh, the people who are doing the work. Are they doing it on their own? Are they a consultant? Are they actually working for a big company that uses the product? Are they actually working for a big company that sells something competing? And the answer is going to be all of those. So who are we talking about when we're talking about all this work? Well, it's everyone who contributes in any way. Uh, that can be, of course, users just asking questions. But it's more commonly all the coders, all the testers, documentation, uh, helping to run community events like Sharon and Rich and Brian and everybody here. Um, everything around it in terms of contributing something back to one of our projects. And we all, as individuals, can contribute work as a user, contributor, a committer. Uh, companies, at least Apache, aren't recognized individually. But of course, we know they hire a lot of our committers uh, to work on our projects. Um, governments, especially in Europe, uh, research and academic institutions are a significant source of either funding or um, input work and contributions to open source projects there. Uh, how does that in, get into our projects and how much of that is that versus all of us as individuals showing up on their own? Um, the ratios of who does what vary across projects and vary across time, but there are some clear trends that span all the major projects. So how do we pay for open source? Well, part of the framework you need to think of whenever you think of funding is we don't pay directly for licenses, of course, because they're open source. And we can download the software for free and use it for free. That's another important aspect. But what's important is how does the project get maintained? How do we submit bugs and then hopefully somebody will listen and maybe fix the bug? How do we find the documentation that someone wrote? 
only a small so in terms of, of thinking about if you're thinking about just money yes that's important but it's a small part of how all of these parts of effort get put into uh, projects uh, which is the most important perspective from a project's point of view from the day-to-day -day maintainers are people you know putting in useful bugs are people helping us review pull requests um, are users helping to support other users those are things the actual work that's shown in the project that shows up in the code base or the website those are what a project often values the most um, we certainly do appreciate other all the other contributions certainly um, but a lot of the day-to-day -day ones are the work. Now, some of that work isn't uh, is individuals working on their own because they enjoy it or they they're learning. And some of it, of course, is corporate employees doing the work. On the other side, so effort is one important thing that I think projects really value the most. At least we think we do. On the other side, does come funding. So if we're all working as individuals and we want to have an event like ApacheCon with this great hop-in platform, there's no way I could could manage that. That requires contracts and funding and enough bandwidth to stream all of our speakers. Um, all the services, so imagine any big data project, how many pipelines of builders they run, how many tests they run automatically. That takes a lot of cloud credits. Those kind of things um, are things that we do require funding for, typically. Uh, you can certainly get some as, as a volunteer on your own or beg at companies, but at a, at a large scale for anything with real data size is um, that needs actual funding to help pay for those services. So I do have a theory about how much of the work overall, if we really look behind the scenes, uh, is from individuals versus being paid for by companies. So I would posit my theory that most of our major open source projects and most of the work done in them is fundamentally from companies that are paid, that are funded somehow. So you may think I'm a little bit crazy, you may not, um, but let's uh, go in, let's go into that. Let's have a framework for how to talk about it and look at some data. So if we think about how we contribute code, documentation, cloud credits, services, all those things, are they direct contributions or indirect contributions? This is an important way to think of that is often not obvious, especially to newcomers to open source. Direct contributions are when I'm sitting down and submitting my code or giving this talk. Um, they can be very obvious in terms of direct contributions of cloud credits. So Apache has many uh, corporate sponsors that essentially give us money to go buy cloud compute time for our many big data projects. Those are very obvious. Indirect contributions are not as obvious. Um, in Drupal, there are many consultants who work for essentially end users, big database, uh, big website people, uh, who hire consultants to build work for them into Drupal. So the work is paid, but it's not obvious who it's from. Uh, that I believe is much more prevalent than we often think. We often don't necessarily think of who's being paid for their work. Um, and of course, funding is a, it's an obvious and direct contribution in one way, the indirect value is that we fund an event or we fund the cloud credits that I said earlier. Um, we often see that funding in a sponsorship page, but the way that that values the project, that the project values, is the fact that they then have tools or have an event where they can actually get work done. So here at Apache, back in 2016, we did a survey of all of our committers across all 200, at the time, just about 200 Apache project communities. Um, at the time, one of the questions was, how do you contribute work to your Apache project? And over, about 50% replied, it was as an employee, as part of their paid job. So right there, we have half of Apache committers um, saying they were doing it because they were getting paid. It wasn't that they were having fun. They might probably having fun too, I hope. 40% um, were as an individual, which is sort of what we think of as an Apache committer doing it on their own, as a consultant who works on different projects, whatever. And 10% were retired students or other, which is great to see in terms of it's a great place to get uh, learning as a, as a newcomer in open source. Um, we ran a similar survey last year with slightly different questions, but the results are the same, that about half of our work is done because someone is paid to do that work at an Apache project. Drupal um, has a great system where they credit work on an individual level, on an individual patch or GitHub poll. Um, 
they allow contributors to list specifically why the work was done. So they've been doing this for years. In 2020, 69% of their work code was listed as wholly sponsored work. So that was either working for a major software vendor as their day job or working for as a consultant for a major uh, website runner who wanted work done that they couldn't do themselves. 16% uh, was work that was a mix or that was not explicitly credited. And only 15% was listed as purely volunteer work. Um, we can also see there's a clear trend in Drupal over the past five years that the wholly sponsored work has been going up. Um, more people have been doing sponsored work. And if we look at the big, big project out there, the Linux kernel, uh, the Linux kernel report uh, tracks every token, everything in um, the Linux world over time. And in 2018, the last time I downloaded a full um, project, 85% of all code in the Linux kernel today was paid corporate work. And in their case, they tie it back to which corporations sponsored the work through employees or by, by directly saying they did it. If we look back in history, um, this, is, this is a trend. This is not a, a, an outlier. It is clearly going up over time. Um, and of course, Linux in particular is a, a very large system, so it's harder to get into. But even in the 2020 kernel report, which has a different reporting format, only 11.9% of commits were from developers were listed as known to be working on their own time. And in that case, we may they may have been contracted by someone. We don't actually know. They don't ask that question. But they, they were seen as developers who tended to be um, independent. And of course, where do we get projects. So that's that's essentially maintaining the things we already know, adding new features to projects we use every day. Where do new projects come from? Where How did Node.js start? Or how did Hadoop start? Um, well, plenty of projects do come from individual developers or small teams. Many of the key um, projects that we use today, the, the things that have become really popular, at one point or another, fundamentally come from businesses. It certainly is all of the above. Right, it, it certainly is coming from passion hobbyists, um, vendor groups collaborating from academic projects. There are a lot of scientific projects that have come from academia and have moved into open source and have ended up attracting significant commercial input in their maintenance going forward. But while the long tail of lone developer open source projects may be interesting technically or interesting to us because we're in this community, when we consider open source that makes an impact that, that really is used around the world by major businesses, by millions of people, we find most either come from corporate spinoffs or from projects that over time have ended up gaining significant corporate contributions that have a major impact on the project. So there are some data. Uh, so hopefully people can see why I said earlier that I think most open source, at least most open source that we use, comes from companies, um, whether it's by being funded directly by companies, indirectly by companies, um, whatever. Um, you know, it's that's something we don't often think about. The, the source code is free and we can share it and it's all over GitHub, but the actual work that's done, uh, a lot of it is run by companies in one way or another. And this is not just major software vendors. This is any sort of vendor that has any staff on that uses software. So of course, if all those companies are out there and actually influencing our projects, both through, of course, money and funding, but also through this quieter way of having their employees work on our projects. How do we help manage that? How can we, you know, think about that? Well, that's where FOSS foundations come into, come into the question. Um, as your project grows, if you're an individual and, and you're passionate and you've got, you know, two friends and you've got the next great idea, how do you keep up with all the other tasks about maintaining a community? When you need to update the website, when you have popularity, you also have bugs, you also have users asking questions. Um, how do you draw in new contributors to help build the project and then get to the next step? Well, this is a great place where FOSS foundations can help be that home that can both shield you from some of the, the um, individual corporate scrutiny but also help provide services and mentors and community assistance that individual projects might not have or might have, but might need a, a breakout into finding a bigger um, market or bigger market rather for people to contribute. Uh, each of things, places like Apache 
Linux Foundation Eclipse, the Software Freedom Conservancy, this is where they shine. And they have um, both the expertise as well as the legal structure to help use some of the direct funding that corporations often want to bring into open source projects. So foundations provide a ton of services. Now at Apache, uh, many of these are still partly provided by volunteers, uh, people like myself, people like Sharon and Rich and Brian, who step up and do the extra work that's not code, it's, it's governance, it's uh, helping review legal questions to see, do we really need a lawyer for this or not? Um, it's funding uh, and getting sponsorships. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of these services really require somebody who's paid or, or somebody who really, really has the passion. It's, it's very hard to find someone for your hosting for gigantic sites or for your infrastructure who is willing to wear a beeper for 24 seven coverage as a volunteer. Um, it's very hard to find the legal and sometimes uh, trademark or fundraising expertise, real sponsorship expertise in terms of talking to major companies and thinking about uh, long-term endowments and so on. That's a hard kind of expertise to find in volunteers. So this is a place that foundations who have some sort of budget and have some sort of governance at a corporate level can help uh, hire, contract, whatever, those services for their projects. And of course, can then look for fundraising to find corporations who will then sponsor the foundation to have the right to pay for those things. So if we look at some different um, foundations, let's actually get some real data in terms of uh, examples of who's out there um, and so on. So most funding for software nonprofits comes at, at scale from corporate grants uh, or recurring sponsors. And several of the larger software foundations like Eclipse and, and Linux so are actually business leagues. So they may be nonprofits, but donations to them are not tax deductible. So there are a lot of individuals who may donate to Apache as an individual and may take a tax write off too, because they use so much for software. For Eclipse and Linux and some other organizations, that's not, you can certainly give them money, but it's not deductible. There, there's certainly, um, they're on a public charity, which is a difference. And of course, in Europe, there are a, a host of different types of organizations, whether they're truly um, nonprofit and charitable organizations helping the world, or whether they're simply uh, business organizations working together for some bigger purpose, uh, but aren't necessarily charitable. So let's look at the Software Freedom Conservancy. Uh, this is a, a very old, in a good way, let's say, um, Organization. It's a 501c3 public charity in the US, so tax deductions are deductible. They actually have 46 projects, which all have independent governance. So the Software Freedom Conservancy certainly is big into um, GPL compliance. They offer those services to projects as their counsel to say, if you have an issue with somebody violating the GPL, we can help handle it for you. Um, they offer IP stewardship, some sponsorship and funding, and of course, legal services. Um, they essentially exist as a, both an advocate for some of the free software principles, but also as essentially a, a legal hat really that lets projects have a legal basis. If, if they need to, if some new project needs to write a contract with some vendor to provide, uh, build services, who's going to sign the contract to actually make that all work? Well, Conservancy and other foundations can do that pretty easily. As an individual, it's not always obvious who, who has the rights to do this and who should do this and who wants to take the risk. So that's one of the important things about foundations is that they give you a legal entity that makes it much easier to talk to many other organizations. So the Conservancy um, at this point has 46 projects, separate projects that are all independent. And some of their sponsors, they're, they list their major sponsors. Um, along with the number of smaller individual sponsors. They don't list sponsorship amounts, but these are the, the top nine, is it? Seven, is it? Um, sponsors currently listed on the Conservancy website. Um, they don't list amounts in terms of who gave, gave what or having specific levels. These are major supporters. Um, but my bet is that the above sponsors here provide the bulk of the Conservancy's annual income. So if we wanna see how much is that actually? What, what kind of money are we talking about here for these 
uh, foundation services that Conservancy provides. Now, again, remember, Conservancy itself doesn't do the work of projects. They provide the services to projects like legal and IP and fundraising, but they are not doing the code. So in terms of that, we can see from in the US, um, nonprofits have to publish their tax returns. Now, of course, if they're a nonprofit, they, they probably don't pay taxes, but they still have to show how much income they made, where they spent their money, so the IRS can evaluate it. Um, we can see the annual, on the left, we can see the gross income for the past few years, which is primarily from donations. They also get some grants. Uh, their income varies, but I would say a rough average is a bit less than $2 million annually going, through the conserv going to the conservancy. And on the right, we could also see their net assets, cash in the bank or investments or computers, I suppose, um, which is actually doing quite well. They're almost in 2018, which is the last year that records are available. Of course, everybody files their taxes uh, at, in the end of the year. And of course, nonprofits off, often ask for an extension. So we don't have data for the last two or three years. But in 2018, their net assets were about $4 million. Uh, so if we think that's 46 projects, about $4 million, that's actually sounds pretty good at this point, but they've been doing well with fundraising lately, um, at least as far as this picture shows. So, you know, they're not, they're not assured of, of, of this kind of income. If we move on to look at, at us, at the Apache Software Foundation, we've got well over 200 projects. Um, of course, while every project is governed independently, we do have the expectation of Apache Way governance. We all use Apache branding um, and so on. And hopefully we're familiar with the kinds of services that we provide. Apache also provides significant infrastructure for our projects. Yay, InfraTeam, they're growing too. Um, we provide significant support for both Apache Con to our projects, as well as some support for projects running their own meetups and things like that. And of course, mentoring. One thing Apache does that Conservancy doesn't really do is uh, the Apache Incubator and the Apache Attic. So at Apache, when you have a project idea you want to, to grow, we can provide the incubator mentors to say, okay, here's how to here's how to turn yourself into a project. Here's how to approach the world. Here's how to become an Apache project and get the recognition that will hopefully last you for a while. And you know, when projects age out, whether through lack of interest or simply some projects are built around standards and they're done. They've built everything they need to build. At that point, we have the Apache Attic, which can then maintain everything, at least read only, so that the software is still available, even if we're not actively maintaining it. So of course, Apache, again, like Conservancy, doesn't build code for our projects with the organization. The, the, the foundation is here to help support you to build the code within your projects. So where do we get our money for this sort of back office stuff? Well, currently Apache's nine platinum sponsors are listed here. Um, these are just the platinum sponsors. Of course, we have a uh, gold and silver and bronze. Um, we also have some in-kind sponsors. Uh, this list as a total, because Apache lists how much our sponsorship levels are, represents a little bit over $1 million in annual in donations or about half of the financial income for the ASF on an annual basis. So these sponsors at Apache get a listing and a thank you on our sponsorship page, but otherwise have no particular influence on how our projects are run. That's part of our, our independence uh, in terms of governance for our projects. And uh, of course we have to say thank you to all our sponsors, which really do make uh, all of this happen both at Apache and at ApacheCon. Now, those are obvious sponsors who to donate money, which most people don't even think about or see, but helps fund all the services that we can provide, including press support and marketing to a degree for our projects. Uh, people don't often see that. Apache also specifically lists our in-kind sponsors. We call them targeted sponsors. Now, these are the current platinum targeted sponsors for the ASF. These are companies that may not provide cash, but provide important services. So. Importantly, these are all things that either our projects or the foundation itself needs to continue to, to operate to help provider services. For example, the first one here, DLA Piper, is the law firm that represents the ASF in most cases. Now, of course, with 200 plus projects, 
we often have random legal questions that need real answers. Uh, we've been served with subpoenas from various courts in the US before, which are pretty important to reply to. So DLA Piper is one example, provides the legal support to enable us to do these things safely. Uh, many of the rest provide, of course, cloud credits, um, uh, build and test rigs, um, significant building rigs for our open source projects, uh, bandwidth, bandwidth has actually been a pretty important thing in the past. So these are all provided for us as specific services directly. But again, we often don't think about these in our daily work in Apache project because they just show up. They're just a service that works usually, we hope. So how much does Apache actually make, so to speak, or, or get donated? Well, over the past several years, um, here is on the left again, the ASF's gross income. Um, we've been averaging about a million dollars until a few years ago when uh, there was both one single time donation along with some changes in major sponsors. Um, but recently it's been around $2 million total income. Um, certainly more projects and more services than conservancy, uh, but slightly smaller funding numbers actually. Um, and again, all of these numbers are taken directly from the tax forms that each foundation provides to the IRS on an annual basis, which is why we're, we're a few years in the past. Um, and the right-hand side, we can see the net assets of the ASF, which were roughly around $2,000 for many years, which is enough of a cushion in terms of if we had serious issues with sponsorships or if we had some sort of risk. Uh, part of the uptick there in 2017 was uh, a, a single time uh, significant donation from the Pineapple Fund, which certainly helped. Um, but that's, you know, when you when you run a nonprofit, you need to think about what if there is a disaster, how long will, will, will our money last? We're not making income by selling anything. Uh, we need to think about if we, if we had to provide things, how long can we last if our sponsors disappeared for some strange reason? Uh, and we're certainly feeling better about that in the past few years. Let's look at the Eclipse Foundation. So they have over 350 projects, um, not just the traditional Eclipse IDE and related projects. Eclipse has really branched out in the past five years. Um, many of the projects have independent governance, kind of like the ASF does, uh, various branding. One thing that Eclipse offers are shared releases. Many projects um, have a similar release train and project where they all synchronize and Eclipse as a foundation provides some of the services to help the projects manage testing cycles and build cycles. Um, and of course, they have development process support and ecosystem. So many Eclipse things work with um, hardware. So they ensure that the people working on the code can also interact with the standards organizations and so on. So they have a lot of services um, they offer their projects. One difference that is not always obvious is Eclipse is a 501c6 business league. That's the, the, in the US, at least the IRS tax code for, they're a nonprofit organization, meaning they don't make a profit that has shareholders or anything, but they're not a charitable organization. You can't donate to them and get a tax write-off, which certainly changes how smaller companies and individuals think about donating. But let's think, who does sponsor the Eclipse Foundation? Well, here we have, um, strategic members. Now, Eclipse has a very detailed list of membership categories, uh, much more detailed than others. And in particular, Eclipse has a mixed model where some of their major sponsors, like the strategic members here, are explicitly both contributing funds and are explicitly contributing uh, essentially engineers or, or marketing people or testers or whatever to the projects that their companies are interested in. So it's a slightly different model than at Apache. Um, these strategic members here, as, a, as does the total, donate about $3 million to Eclipse annually, which again is roughly half of Eclipse's income, or at least it has been in the past. Um, one important note about Eclipse is they have recently reorganized from being in the US and Canada to recently, which is not shown here, um, into a Belgian nonprofit with a US and Canadian subsidiary. So. They have a sort of, um, they're changing their model to better address the European market, which is important for a lot of their projects. But if we look at funding for Eclipse in the US, which has in the past been their primary uh, entity, 
we can see here. Um, there on the left, their gross income has averaged pretty steadily around $4 million a year. Uh, more projects and more services, but notably higher funding. Um, part of the stability there is certainly that their mixed model where uh, corporations both provide funding and provide explicitly provide work for projects uh, certainly gives a better alignment to a long term. You know, one company said, OK, we're going to we're going to fund this and we're going to put a team of people on it because it's a strategic strategic part of our company. Um, one thing which which uh, reminds us when we're looking at funding or finances, rather, uh, you can't just look at tax returns because the Eclipse Foundation in the US, their net assets have trended towards zero over the past years, which clearly is not a representative of how um, how they're doing. That's clearly a, an accounting difference than uh, the ASF and Conservancy have. So if we move on to the last organization we have here is the Linux Foundation. Um, so I say 150 plus projects here um, in the past couple of years, the Linux Foundation has added a lot of other, let's say smaller projects or community efforts. Um, their projects have a mixed kind of governments, governance. So each many projects have their own bylaws, which specify often corporate involvement in their boards, in their technical review committee, whatever their structure happens to be. Um, they each have independent branding. So the Linux Foundation doesn't have, you know, there aren't many Linux X projects. They're all separate. One thing the Linux Foundation does do is scalable services. So they operate with an agency model where there actually are a significant number of people who work for the foundation behind the scenes who then serve as, as experts in whether it's legal or in infrastructure or community management as resources for their many, many, many projects. They also have ecosystem development, much like Eclipse, uh, as well as marketing. And uh, anybody who's been to a Linux Foundation conference knows they certainly run great conferences that are uh, many, uh, many different scales. So they do all of this work as a, as a business league with these projects. Uh, well, who sponsors Linux Foundation? Well, that's a complicated question because many of the major Linux Foundation projects have their own separate funding models. So if we look at the Linux Foundation itself, which is merely the, the, the headquarters, the, the tie together of all Linux Foundation projects, there are 15 platinum corporate members of the Linux Foundation as a whole. Uh, if we look up on their website to become a platinum corporate, corporate member, is about half a million dollars US annually. And that provides these corporations with representatives on both the board of the foundation, as well as in some of the technical bodies within the foundation or specific projects. So this list here represents about $7 million of annual income for the Linux Foundation. So that's the foundation itself kind of behind the scenes. Well, if we look at something you might have heard of more, the CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, that's a subsidiary of the Linux Foundation. It's not a separate organization. And they have their own list of platinum member sponsors. Each of these sponsors are donating a minimum of $250,000 US to the CNCF, which essentially goes to the Linux Foundation. So these organizations in, in this, this slide here with this money um, are representing, they're just sponsoring the CNCF. And this represents about $4 million in annual income, if not possibly more for the CNCF and of course the whole Linux Foundation. Let's look at a smaller project, Hyperledger. Um, there are seven premier members of the Hyperledger Foundation, which of course they have a, their own corporate structure, their own way to sponsor. Um, each of these provides about, again, $250,000 annually donation to the Hyperledger Foundation as well as employees working on the Hyperledger software itself. While this may not seem like a really big list, Hyperledger in particular lists 116 other corporate supporting members, each of whom also probably chips in tens of thousands of dollars annually, along with dues to the Linux Foundation. So this list right here, just for Hyperledger, probably represents about $2 million in annual income for Hyperledger and the Linux Foundation. We want to go a little bit smaller. 
uh, one of many other projects we've heard of, the OpenJS or Node.js Foundation. It's now the OpenJS Foundation, Athletic Foundation. They have four platinum members of their foundation. Uh, again, about a quarter, quarter million each. So this list here, just for OpenJS, represents about a million dollars in annual income to the Linux Foundation, along with all the great software they do. So who sponsors the Linux Foundation and the hundreds of collaborative projects that run at the Linux Foundation? Well, a lot of companies. Um, it's not, these are all together as one corporate entity in, in the, the background in terms of the funding. Um, and what I find interesting is if we look at all these different foundations, many of the same corporations show up over and over again. So there are many, especially software vendors, but not just software vendors, show up for the CNCF or for Hyperledger or for one of the other infrastructure projects there or for one of the automobiles projects at Linux Foundation, everything. That's where a lot of corporate involvement goes, both in terms of actual funding, cash funding, as well as Many of those organizations are putting up many engineers to work on those projects. There's a significant corporate involvement there. So how much does this all add up to? Does anybody have a guess? Well, from again, the Linux Foundation doesn't report the results, but they do report to the IRS. And up to 2019, which is the most recent form that the IRS has published, we can see the Linux Foundation's income and assets. So on the left, we see their annual gross income, which in 2019 was reaching just about $100 million a year. On the right-hand side, we see certainly a little dip there, but the net assets on the right-hand side in 2019 um, were nearly $60 million. So that's $60 million in cash and investments in real estate, probably, certainly in, in hardware, I imagine. Um, but this shows... Um, I was a little bit surprised to see just how big the Linux Foundation had, had grown, both in terms of their funding, but also in terms of how many projects they have, which each have their own sponsorship and governance models. Um, they really have become uh, sort of an elephant in the room, um, providing a lot of services and certainly running a lot of projects. They're, we all use something from Linux Foundation somewhere, um, but this was quite an eye opener to see how that scale works differently in terms of actual funding. Um, and of course, as a business league, the Linux Foundation doesn't provide public bu budget figures directly. Um, most uh, nonprofit charities like Apache and the Software Freedom Conservancy provide open budget books, um, but the Linux Foundation does not, nor does Eclipse really. Uh, so we don't know what the past couple of years have held for Eclipse because the IRS forms will not come out for quite a while. So uh, I bet those numbers are a little bit surprising. They were certainly were surprising to me when I actually looked through the 990s and saw the actual annual income reported. Um, but besides being surprising, it's important to understand that all the services we rely on, for example, the conference we're having right now relies on the ASF having sponsors to be able to pay for the hop-in service we're using, to be able to pay for the marketing and the sponsorship and the rest of the things around the conference that make it really work. Um, so these four foundations, along with many others, of course, provide really valuable fiscal, community, legal, everything hosting to a large percentage of the software that really we really use every day. There certainly are many other interesting open source projects out there, but the ones that really make an impact and that are going someplace are typically at a foundation somewhere. But all that being said, that's important to understand. But what's really important in terms of how a project works is what we do here at Apache. Governance and funding, but governance and community all matter. How the project is going to move forward, agree to do the work and uh, get it done matters beyond just the funding. So one thing about the ASF is we offer the whole life cycle and we also offer long-term support. So when you come to Apache, you become an Apache project and that really means something in the world uh, beyond the, the things we've talked about here and beyond the governance. So uh, I hope that was helpful to get people to think of it's not just 
the work we're contributing. It's not just companies sometimes writing a check. It's really a mixed model of how open source and how FOSS gets funded, in particular, how foundations get funded. Um, and that is about what we have for time. So I will hang around either here or over in the hallway track in the sessions tab if people have questions. And I will tweet out where the slides are and hopefully some research that people can do um, later on shortly. So I thank everyone. And if there are questions, I can take them over in the chat. Session. Oh, here we go. So can the ASF as a 501c3 invest in their own startup to, uh, can the ASF, a question the channel was, could we invest in our own for-profit startup as a spin-off of the foundation? Um, yes, we could. Uh, the Mozilla Foundation is, is exactly that. Mozilla has two, two sister organizations. One is clearly for-profit uh, with search ads and so on. And the other one is the nonprofit that builds the software. Um, that being said, I can't see the ASF ever doing that. We, our strength is providing independent home so that the people doing the work on the software can stay away from all those funding questions and stay away from the corporate changes that happen a lot and have a more stable development world here. That's what we hope to do. Um, so another question is, uh, Apache projects, there are often two cat main categories of projects, um, enterprise mission critical and hobbyist. Um, Yes, I, I think that's making it a little bit too simple. I think there's really a gradation of projects, um, especially when we look at the scientific projects. There are about half a dozen uh, significant scientific management, big data analysis projects that have come to the ASF in the past, say, six or seven years, uh, many from NASA and JPL um, that aren't really necessarily enterprise projects, but are still very significant projects used across uh, science institutions and research places, which I think that's another thing where it's not obvious that you're going to find a corporate sponsor, whether in terms of cash or, uh, you know, in terms of a corporation who will want to, you know, hire five engineers to build a new feature, but it's still a significant factor in a lot of, um, research and academic, academic work. Um, so I think there's more of a gradations than that in terms of sponsored work we the the question with sponsored work is we often don't know who within a community is being paid for their work unlike drupal for example actually has a system in their effectively their their bug system and their pull request system that every time you make a code commit you're asked was the sponsored work or not and there's a little form you can fill out um, we have never done that i don't know that we would but um we often don't know whether somebody's doing it as an organization or not. Uh, clearly, there are some projects that clearly have, uh, you know, a couple of software vendors who dominate in terms of the work done. Yes, um, but that's okay as long as the overall governance still allows other people to have their say, to have their um, input con considered and accepted. Uh, another great question is. Do Apache projects need to hunt down and handle issues with products sold using Apache libraries without license? Um, so as long as you're not misusing our brand and our name, you can use our software for whatever you want. Uh, we're quite happy for have someone to have someone take an Apache project, slap a new name on it and charge money. Uh, it's kind of silly because you could just download it from us, but, um, Met, many of the corporations who sponsor work effectively, whether it's a plugin model or a support model like Red Hat or whatever, essentially turn around and take the work they have given to our project that does something useful. And they then make money by selling it as something additional or by selling support, whatever. That's part of how our world works here at the ASF. Now, of course, that does not include using our brands or our trademarks. Um, one thing that I think it's a little disappointing that other licenses don't have, but the Apache license, if you look up, I believe it's clause six, explicitly it excludes trademarks from the license. 
So you do not have any rights to use the trademark. You only have rights to use the software to, to do things, essentially. Uh, and that's it I so saw for the questions I see so far. And I will be posting a slides on Twitter shortly, and I will be going over to the um, hallway track. Craig Hunt is asking, if a startup organization investment owned by the ASF or Pittman Public Trust, would this eliminate conflict? That's a great question. And it's one that's far too complicated to talk about here. Um, I think the answer to that from the Apache perspective, now, that certainly is a question that if you asked at Eclipse or Linux Foundation, you would get a different answer. But the Apache perspective is, if you want to find a way to make money off of using Apache software, go do it. And don't involve the ASF in terms of how that how you make the money, how the corporation works, whatever. Um, what we want to do is focus on communities of people who want to build the software and talk about it and make it better. And if you want to find a way to commercialize things, that's great. You're welcome to contribute to our project on our terms, but your commercialization is yours. Um, that's key because Apache then can be neutral. We can then invite all comers even companies who compete against each other in the commercial world can then come work on it, some shared piece, some plugin, some underlying library, whatever it is, at us profitably, right? Because they then go make their own things, uh, which are built on top of it, which make the money, whatever their exciting thing is. I, I don't care. What I care about is the fact that we now have a better thingamajig they've both contributed to that we can then give away to everyone who wants to do something. <laughs> Somebody just said, I want all the money to go to the ASF. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and yes, the trademarks are an important part. So uh, Sharon, is there, I think we're well over time and we probably need to, to move out of the bandwidth way for somebody else to come along. Um, is that right? Well, unfortunately, no. Um, our next session has been um, been canceled. So. Oh no, um, our next yeah. session is canceled. Yeah, yeah. So um, now this was the um, the Apache Way talk that we had. So we were expected to have a, a video uh, to to play for the session, but we haven't yeah. received that yet. So um, we'll as soon as once when we get that video, we'll upload it to the YouTube channel. But at the moment, um, we haven't got anything to play for that session. So unfortunately, that session has been cancelled. So the next talk uh, on the community track will be uh, the one after. And that will be uh, the one around from, let me have a look, it's from Martin, uh, Beyond the Bus Factor. So that one. So that's that's the next talk on this track. And I think that will be the last one today. So thank you very much, Shane, for, uh, for the presenta presentation. And I hope you have, have all learned something, because I have as well. <laughs> Yay. So that's great. All right. So thank you very much. Thanks, Shane. OK, uh, I will. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'll post the slides. And of course, all the videos and all that will come out um, on the Apache Foundation channel on YouTube. So uh, stay tuned if you want to hear more about details. And I will be over in the um, hallway track if people have questions. So thanks and bye. <laughs>